Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is David May. Welcome to the second webinar on mentoring of uh, 2018 presented by the National Mentoring Community. The National Mentoring Community, or NMC, is a program of the American Physical Society, APS, and it aims to help provide support to undergraduate physics students who are from racial and ethnic minority groups as they make their way to degree completion. Um, again, my name is David May. I'm here at APS, where I'm the program manager for the NMC program, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. I would um, like to introduce our primary speaker for the webinar, Dr. Christine Fund. Chris is the director for the center, um, director of the Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experiences in Research, or SIMR. She's also the PI and director of the Mentor Training Corps of the National Research Mentoring Network and an associate scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she will also be joined um, periodically um, by Dr. Melissa McDaniels, who's an assistant dean at Michigan State in the graduate school. Uh, Melissa is also co-director of the Master Facilitator Initiative at the National Research Mentoring Network and is an affiliate of SIMR. So Chris and Melissa will be presenting the webinar in a mixture of formats, and I just wanted to orient you to that. She'll present a traditional slideshow, but also pause several times to get feedback from all of you. And of course, you'll be able to ask questions. So to help you interact with her at these times, here's a really brief rundown of what to expect um, in case you haven't used this platform before. So you should all have a window that looks something like the next slide. Um, which has is titled the GoTo Webinar Control Panel. There it is. And uh, for this panel, we're actually going to use the first two things that are circled there, the questions and poll. Um, but not we're not actually not going to use the chat function because that's not supported for you participants. So first, the questions box. In the questions box, you can ask questions at any time during the webinar by typing them, typing them into the box. Um, those of us uh, moderating and presenting will be reviewing these questions as they come in and may either answer them in writing or save them for, for Chris and Melissa to answer uh, later on when they get a chance during the webinar. Uh, you should also use this box for short written responses when Chris asks you some questions, which she will do. Um, and then on the next slide uh, is about the poll function, which works like this. We're just going to do a quick practice run. Um, so please give a quick answer. I just picked up, picked some random colors. Doesn't matter what you answer, just choose one right now real quick. And we're getting several answers coming in. And 86% um, of you have voted, I can tell. So um, if you haven't voted, if you're not able to open the poll window, um, let us know in the question area if you're not able to do that, and we'll um, make sure to look at that when we're asking you questions as well. All right, why don't we go ahead and close the poll, and you'll see a, um, there's the result. So half of you picked green. Okay, so that's basically how the polls run. Um, and so next, um, let's see, I hope this helps you get the most out of the webinar. And just to remind you, a link to a recording of today's webinar, as well as these slides uh, and other resources will be put on the NMC website uh, sometime after today's event. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Chris to begin her presentation. So Chris, take it away. Great, thank you to David um, and um, the APS and the National Mentoring um, Network uh, for this opportunity. I also want to thank my colleague, Melissa McDaniels. Um, uh, as you may be able to tell, um, I'm dealing with a bit of laryngitis, and so um, Dr. McDaniels was nice enough as a master facilitator to agree to join me today in the event that I lose my voice or she can jump in. She'll also be able to answer questions um, verbally as well as in the question window. Um, we have the opportunity to work a lot together um, helping to optimize mentoring relationships. So this is the second webinar in a series 
Um, and um, if you were here last time, we did some introductory activities about who's in the room. We're gonna do those again, just to get a sense of who's joining us today so that we can um, address and extrapolate to your situations. Um, then I'm gonna have a little recap of webinar number one in case you missed it. Uh, today, we're gonna be focusing on fostering independence, growth mindset, and resources on mental health. And then we're gonna ask for your input on topics for our final webinar of this series, which will be on October, uh, April 24th. So again, just as a reminder, um, we're gonna be using the question window as well as the polling, which you've just tried out. So to get us going, I'd like to know where folks are coming from and where they currently work, your institution or organization. So in the questions window, if you'd be willing uh, to type in uh, where you currently work, we'll get a sense of who's here today. And Sarah, will you please remind me if everyone's able to see everyone's answers or if we need to recap those verbally for everyone? Maybe, David, you might know the answer to that. I do not remember the answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, I'd be happy to read them off real quick. Great, that would be awesome, thank you. Oh, they cannot see them. Yeah, you could just read them off, that would be great and save my voice a little. Sure, sure, so uh, we have folks from Rowan University in New Jersey, uh, Columbia University um, Physics Department, um, CCA Flatiron Institute, um, Kansas State and University of Calgary. Um, sorry, I have to keep resizing my window. Um, another from Ro Rowan University, uh, California, um, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, um, Chamron University of Aquas, not sure where that is, um, American University, uh, let's see, someone from a four-year private liberal arts university, didn't say which one, University of Dallas, uh, Texas State University, and um, that's it. Great. And I'm here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, as um, David said, uh, let you know, and Melissa is from Michigan State University. And it looks like University of Dallas uh, was that for your private um, in the physics department, Jacob. Uh, Wonderful. Thanks so much for reading those off. Great. So let's do a quick poll to kind of get a sense of who's here today. So I'm curious what career stage all of you are at. So you can use the poll and I'll launch that. Give us a sense of what career stage folks are in uh, who are participating today. Give folks just a couple more seconds. And again, if you're having any trouble with the polling window, please let us know by typing that in the questions window and we can help you. All right, great. So let me share those results with you. So as we might expect, uh, the majority of folks here today are faculty, um, as this was a reach out um, to a lot of faculty who are mentoring, um, but very happy to have graduate students who are often, often engaged in mentoring undergrads and other uh, graduate students as well, so wonderful. All right, so I'd also like to know, um, how many folks um, you're currently mentoring. And if you're not mentoring anyone that's now, that's absolutely fine. But just to get a sense since the topic is mentoring, how many mentees you're currently mentoring? And I would say if you're wondering, what I mean is kind of the direct mentor, um, someone who your mentee would consider to be their mentor. I've got about half of you have responded already, so thank you. Give it another couple seconds. All right, great. So what you can see here is we've got about half folks mentoring a lot of mentees, more than four. Um, about a quarter of you who are not currently mentoring, you may have mentored in the past or might be waiting for a future opportunity. And then a couple folks, one and two, so thanks. All right, so one more question here. 
uh, what are the career stages for those of you who are mentoring? What are the career stages of the folks you're mentoring? Give you a couple seconds. Great, okay. So what we're seeing here is a large majority of you are mentoring undergrads, and of course that is definitely the focus today. Um, but some of you mentoring graduate students or more than one group. Um, when we get to talking about mental health, I'll raise some issues about general student mental health, especially the college population, but I'll also um, pay attention to graduate student mental health, which has been a very, very hot topic, especially in the last month um, with some articles coming out um, in some journals. Great. All right. So I wanted uh, for those folks who did not have the opportunity to be with us last month, um, I wanted to just give a couple uh, introductory slides to make sure that we're all starting on the same page. So last time we talked about the science of mentorship and attributes for effective mentoring and mentor training. We really focused on providing feedback, so effective communication and culture and communications. We focused on building research self-efficacy or helping mentees believe they could do research. And then we provided some resources. Um, the webinar and all of those resources are posted on the NMC website. If you have any trouble accessing that, you can reach out to David and he can get you there. Um, but all of those materials are there as well as the, um, the materials from today will be posted there as well. So these, uh, I just want to share a couple slides with you from last time as a reminder or as an introduction if you missed it, that there have been a lot of outcomes that have been linked to mentored research experience and strong mentorship. And showing here a large um, uh, swath of the literature showing that mentorships linked to research identity, sense of belonging and self-efficacy, persistence, productivity, career satisfaction, and really has been incredibly effective in enhancing the recruitment of underrepresented minorities to science as well as their retention and persistence. When I talk about mentoring, I think it's important to have a common definition, and I shared this last month. We're really talking about a collaborative learning relationship. We want to pay attention to the fact it proceeds through purposeful stages over time. And its goal is always mentee-centered. It's helping them get the competencies they need to be successful in whatever career they choose. And importantly, as a mentor, it includes your own experience and your personal to support personal intellectual growth of your mentee. And it can apply to lots of different kinds of mentoring, the traditional dyadic mentoring relationship in a research lab, but it can apply to multiphasic or mosaic mentoring, career coaching, peer mentoring. It can happen in person at a distance. And we talked a lot about the different attributes for effective research mentoring relationships. We talked about mentors having to help support mentee skill development around research. It embodies interpersonal skills. It's important to pay attention to psychosocial skills, and we talked about research self-efficacy last time. There's a whole attention that needs to be paid to diversity and culturally focused skills, especially when we're working across racial, ethnic, gender, or other diversity demographic lines. And then a whole domain of sponsorship skills. So today, um, we're gonna be drawing, continuing to draw on a large uh, array of mentoring um, materials that have been developed in partnership with the National Research Mentoring Network, which is funded by the NIH, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the NSF. Um, we've been working to develop mentor and mentee training interventions. We develop uh, training that can be implemented face-to-face -face or online, and I've listed a whole bunch of things here, and showed you just a wide array of published and online resources um, that we have had the opportunity to develop and test. And we've studied many of these interventions and I just have some here. I'm not gonna go through any of these data, but just to tell you that what you're experiencing draws upon a large evidence base and a huge group of uh, researchers and curriculum developers who have worked over the last 10 to 12 years um, to develop materials and continue to do that work. So I wanted to start um, with a question um, that really will get you in the mindset of mentoring and the important role it can have. So I'd ask you in the question window to respond to this um, prompt, which is to write the first name of an important mentor in your life, and then it put separated by a comma, the age when they most impacted you. So for example, for me, an important mentor in my life was named Paul, 
And he really actually had a critical impact on me at about the age of 29 when I was just finishing graduate school. So I'll give you just a minute to see that. So thanks, David uh, is the name of a mentor at the age of 20. I won't read all the names, but I wanna get a sense of uh, names, gender and age. Got about 12 people who've reported already, thanks. I'll give a couple more minutes, maybe one more minute. I like how, Jeremy, you have an explanation mark after the age of 40. I think it's always important to know we're always still being mentored, not knowing your current age, but lifetimes of mentors. All right, so um, thanks for sharing. What's really interesting is the diversity of um, names and ages. What I can tell you is that a large number of the names shared were, uh, the, were typically male names. I only point that out not to um, uh, make any judgment about that, but that ten, tends to be um, the makeup of the field in, um, in terms of its male dominance. And so it's not surprising that many of us in the field might have had male mentors early on. Um, the age ranges from 16 uh, to 40. And I really think this is an important point is that today we're gonna focus a lot on the mentoring of undergrads kind of in that typical 18 to 22 window, although there is a, a diversity of ages um, of undergrad population. But that as graduate students, we uh, lean on mentors, maybe into the postdoc and into our careers now, um, many of us still looking um, for mentorship and for that incredible impact. So um, I wanna dive into the first topic that we're going to talk about today, which is fostering independence. So independence is a word that we often throw around when we're talking about mentorship. Many of us I'm sure have said is my goal is to help enable and produce independent scholars or help people on their pathway to independence. We often tout that one of the um, things that uh, researchers have to achieve is a, is a level of independence. We use the word of independence often when we write letters of recommendation for people as they think about moving from undergrad to grad school. We certainly include the word independence when we're talking about research proposals or promotion and tenure. So I wanna unpack that a little bit. Um, and one way to do that, um, I think, is to first get around independence and sometimes some of the assumptions. So I'd like to start with a case study. And just to save my voice, I'd like to ask Melissa if she'd be willing to come on and read this. Um, and then when she's done, I'd like to invite you in the question box to share your initial reactions to the case. Hi there, everyone. Um, Chris, no problem. Fostering independence, a case study. I'm working with a new graduate student, and I just can't seem to get along with her. I told her at the beginning of the semester that I thought we should have weekly meetings to talk about her progress, and she agreed. At our next meeting, I asked her to run through the list of things she accomplished that week. She had no notes and seemed pretty unprepared for talking about her work in the level of detail that I expected. She's been canceling most of our meetings at the last minute. Either she doesn't feel well, or she suddenly remembers an assignment for another class that's due the next day. I know that she's doing the work because at the few meetings she does keep, she has a lot to say, but her progress on the project is very uneven, both in time taken and in quality. And I'm often forced to suggest that she redo critical pieces. I fear these critical meetings leave her demoralized and less interested in accepting guidance from me, but I don't know how else um, to approach this. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. So give me your first initial reactions uh, in the question window uh, to this uh, case study. And again, I purposely started with a graduate student mentee here, but we'll explore undergraduate mentees in a second. <laughs> Stephanie says she's been there. And Eleanor says, sounds like the mentor is not listening well. That is a possibility for sure. Uh, also, um, uh, Eleanor Sayer is saying, um, not in a, uh, addition to Eleanor Close, grad students anxious about performing in front of the mentor. So absolutely, there can be some performance anxiety. There could have other um, anxiety or mental health issues, and we'll definitely be diving into that later uh, in the webinar. Uh, 
Uh, could be some uh, DARSA saying some time management uh, might be an issue. Uh, Michael's bringing up issues of confidence. Maybe uh, the student needs some more guidance. So I'll give folks another 30 seconds if they want to share. So Jeremy is saying they'd want to discuss the student what they hope to get from the mentoring to get input on expectations. Yep. Maybe an earlier intervention bringing up the, the uh, concern about cancellations. Uh, Phillip's raising that and Jacob is talking about um, the student doesn't know what's required. So this case brings up a lot of things about expectations. Um, and I think one of the important things is that we have this sometimes unspoken expectation about a certain level of independence, but it's not always expressed. So before I go there, I wanna pose a question and you're um, willing uh, to put a response to it in the question uh, window is, would you read this case or react to it any differently if the student was an undergraduate? In a simple yes or no. So I see some yeses, I see some noes, a little. All right, we've got a 50-50 split right now in people saying yes or no. Um, Jeremy has said they'd ex have different, uh, probably higher expectations, more mature and reliable for grad students. But Eleanor say, say, saying that uh, grad students are basically just undergrads with higher pay grade. <laughs> so I raise that because I think it's very important when we're mentoring undergraduates, and then for those of you who are mentoring graduate students, to think about what we mean in terms of independence across those career stages. And so some of the questions that I'd like to pose, and you don't need to answer these in the question window, but as mentors to really start to grapple with how we define independence. And so what does independence look like for a first year grad student, a later grad student, a postdoc? And I put those later career stages in, uh, on purpose because what we expect from a first year grad student in particular has influence on what we expect from an undergraduate, especially those junior, senior undergraduates. And one of the challenges is to really come up with concrete indicators that a student on the path to independence would have to illustrate. So, and then would that list align with mentees? So let's use the case study as an example. If we were to ask a student, let's say a senior undergrad who's working with you, if we were to ask them, what are the expectations for your preparation for meetings with your mentor? How much do they expect you to do on your own ahead of time? How much do they expect you to follow up after the meeting? what would their answers be? And would those be anywhere in alignment for expectations you had given them about what you expect them to do ahead of time? The other thing around independence, and this gets at conveying what level of independence you're expecting from them, is that often independence is this very vague concept. And so, and it's often interpreted to mean on your own. So I actually would like to get rid of the word independence completely, because especially in the world of team science now, independence actually is counter uh, intuitive and so when an undergraduate in particular hears independent what they often hear is i need to do it alone what we often mean by that is we mean that you're taking it upon yourself to look for answers talk to other people before you talk to me as your mentor or i'm expecting you to come in the door with articulate questions questions you've thought about questions you may have even tried to figure out yourself before you come to me so that I can see your process. So I raise these questions because as mentors, one of the things that we'd like to suggest is that you take some time in your practice to really think about what independence looks like concretely for the career stage of mentees you're working with and to ask them what they think, what they think independence would look like, what they think they have to be able to show you. Um, that they, in terms of their path to independence, how they define independence, and then to have a discussion about where there's a match and mismatch. So I wanna pause there um, and just give folks a second um, or two if they have any re reactions or questions about that um, in the question window.
And of course, Melissa, feel free to jump in if you want to add anything. Interesting. Um, I will jump in here. Looks like Eleanor is very interested, and this is maybe something we can talk about now or later, in mentees who are not students. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not. So can you give an example um, of, of who, the mentees that are not students or would they be interns from another um, area? Eleanor, could you type something in there? Or a research technician? Uh, junior faculty. Yeah. Mm. Great. Did you want to speak to that, Melissa, at all? Um, you. Okay, I can't. <laughs> Thanks. So, yeah. So when you're mentoring folks from different institutions, um, that can be a different set, kind of relationship. You usually probably find yourself in the role much more of career mentor, although if you're working on a joint research project, you border it probably on mentor slash collaborator. Um, and when it gets around independence, one of the things um, um, in terms of um, mentees who are not your students is really around what is expected of them in terms of advancement and so this word independence gets thrown around all the time for junior faculty on what you do on your own so um, i actually can um, share with you um, maybe matt can send me your email if, if that's okay with you um, some really interesting articles about that in terms of mentoring junior faculty i see matt has also asked the level of independence for undergrads um, yeah, so we don't have time today, but one of the activities um, that we often do with mentors is to have them uh, start to collectively make a list of things they can expect from undergraduates, whether it's a third year undergrad, um, a finishing a senior undergrad, so maybe a sophomore or senior, maybe a first and second year grad student, um, and create a list. Um, we have some really wonderful um, community-derived lists. Um, of expectations across those career stages. And there's some wonderful articles about that as well, um, which we can pass along to David to post uh, on the community site. Great, all right. Well, for the sake of time, I also wanna uh, move on. Um, I wanted to introduce, for some of you this may be familiar, but just to make sure everybody is aware, um, on individual development plans. So what these are are planning and communication tools that allow mentees to identify their research and career goals and to communicate them with you, their mentor or their mentor team, or even department chairs or, or program advisors uh, in the case of undergrads or grads. So in simply, an IDP can look like this. It's basically what are your long-term goals, your short-term goals, what skills do you need, what activities are helping you get those skills, how are you coming along, who's helping you get there. And so I just wanted um, to ask this question, and I'm current, uh, these are most often used um, with graduate students and postdocs, but there's some wonderful examples of undergraduate IDPs as well to use as tools to help figure out what your students are looking for um, long-term so that you can align your mentorship of them with those goals. So I'm gonna launch a poll just kind of asking your familiarity with using these with any career stage. Great. All right, I'm going to share those results. So it looks like about 70% of you haven't used a formal template, but you regularly talk about um, career plans. Um, some folks have used them, and small folk haven't heard of them. So what I'd like to share with you um, is that, oops, sorry. Um, uh, and again, this will be posted um, on the mentoring website, um, is that there are a collection of IDPs. Um, the Science Career at My IDP is a really wonderful website that takes students through skills and interests and helps them determine kind of their next step in their career goal. Um, and then there's lots of paper-based ba guides and templates. Um, and so many are here, some are for grad students, some are for junior faculty, some are for undergrads. Um, and so uh, if you haven't used one of these and you're interested in pursuing it, um, these might be interesting to look at. Um, 
if you're working with grad students and postdocs, these are likely to be things um, that your graduate school may be using as well. Um, but I really am a big proponent um, of using them at the undergraduate level as well. Um, and again, that specific undergraduate example, um, we'll be sending to David to post in the resources. So the next topic um, we wanted to dive into and spend about 15 minutes on is growth mindset. So growth mindset um, um, is really uh, in, held in contrast to fixed mindset. And it's really about the perception of what you're kind of born with um, and what you can develop. Um, and so when people are being surveyed about whether they're more fixed mindset or growth mindset, and again, this is in a judgment call, they're often asked questions like the next one. So I thought I'd put this poll question up. This is actually a question right out of the growth mindset assessment survey. And so let me hide that. Um, and so uh, let me go back one slide really quick because I didn't realize you couldn't see it. So this is just, again, um, growth mindset versus, versus fixed mindset. So I'm going to start uh, this poll and launch it. So again, uh, there's no right or wrong way to be, but I'm just curious um, about your agreement with the following statement. All right, so I'm going to close that poll and share it with you. So what we see is um, a lot of folks almost half disagreeing um, that you have a certain amount of intelligence and you can't really much change it. Some strongly agreeing and some folks agreeing with that, that there's a certain amount of intelligence. So these are the kinds of um, questions, I think, that help us think about our assumptions about intelligence and kind of um, dive into the mindset um, that we come from, as well as considering and reflecting upon the mindset we're using when we work with students. So um, just to give you a little background, so growth mindset's really the idea that intelligence is not fixed. It really thinks about the brain as a muscle and that knowledge and skills can be gained with effort and practice. So students, but students who maintain a growth mindset, they tend to view intelligence of male, as malleable and something that can be improved, while those with fixed mindsets believe intelligence is relatively unchanged. So you might consider a quote of, I can't complete this skill yet, but if I work hard and use resources available to me, I'll succeed. And that would be a growth mindset. Consider versus someone saying, your intelligence is something about you you can't change very much. Now, there are folks across the spectrum in where they fall on this growth or fixed mindset spectrum. Um, but it's something that you may have heard about and something that I think is really important to explore as mentors. So some of the um, research that has come out over the last decade um, has really shown that a fixed mindset's more likely um, to experience stereotype threat and lower performance. Now, this might make sense because if you believe that intelligence is set and not malleable, then if you believe that a certain group um, tends to perform less well or historically has performed less well in a given area, and you believe that you cannot improve in that area, you're going to experience that stereotype threat, the belief that, in fact, you will meet the expectations of the given group. Now, if you have a growth mindset, the mind like a muscle, they tend to see higher semester grades and better math performance, and there's a lot of research showing that as well. So when we think about our role as mentors, growth mindset is often talked about in the context of a classroom um, and what teachers can do and teachers' belief in their stu students' ability to learn. But mentors can really help mentees develop a growth mindset in three ways, cognitively, socially, emotionally, and identity development. So you can play a very interesting role in helping mentees to think about how they can grow cognitively, but also how they can grow and learn what's happening around them socially and in terms of their emotional intelligence. And you can help them in terms of ways of thinking about how they can change and thinking about how their identity may change as they uh, spend more and more time in the uh, research arena as undergraduates and then if they go on to graduate school. So we wanted to share with you a couple of concrete strategies that you might consider to help your mentee develop a growth mindset. So one is that if in fact you yourself have a growth mindset or you at least reflect on that, you can model that. So just sharing your own experiences with adapting a growth mindset can be really powerful for your mentee. 
talking about situations in which you really struggled with something. You didn't think you were smart enough to understand it. You didn't feel like you had had enough experience to socially um, fit in uh, in that particular academic climate, um, where you didn't feel like a scientist and you didn't believe you ever would. Those experiences and showing them how you worked through that and were able to grow and now feel smart enough, now feel like you socially fit in the academic enterprise, now feeling like you are a scientist can be incredibly powerful in showing them that not everybody starts out that way, that you can grow, it's malleable, it's attainable. The other thing is that you can teach mentees about growth mindset and the importance of having a growth mindset in undergrad and grad. Um, I particularly pulled out graduate school here um, because of one of the most recent articles um, that'll be in the resources, but this is across the career spectrum. So one is to simply share this really wonderful seven minute video from Karen Dweck, who's really the kind of guru on growth mindset. Um, I also included here, and they'll be posted in the slides um, that David will post, a blog from Grad Hacker, which talks about grad students and fixed versus growth mindset. Um, and then a wonderful um, online uh, resource on changing your mindset, which is focused across career stages. And so here's some ideas from that last website about um, really um, encouraging mentees. So you can encourage your undergrad mentees to hear, learn to hear the fixed mindset voice. For example, if they say to themselves, I'm only as good as my achievements, that is gonna come from a fixed mindset. Um, and you might encourage them to think about, but wait, can you also be as good as your progressions, as each step forward? Helping them recognize they have a choice and that they can admit they're struggling, it doesn't mean they're inadequate. This is really, really important um, when we're working with students um, from traditionally underrepresented groups who may feel that they haven't had adequate preparation. It does not mean that they're not capable of it. It may simply mean that they haven't had a chance to work through it yet. You can encourage them to talk back to their fixed mindset with a growth mindset voice saying, with effort, I can do something I find difficult and it difficult and it'll get easier. I think a perfect example of this is the first time you ask an undergrad mentee to write something um, and you end up red penning all over it. He's saying with effort, you can get better to the point where actually you're gonna be writing things that don't need 20 drafts. They may only need two drafts. It takes a long time, but you can get there. And finally, taking a growth mindset action um, is, um, uh, yeah, using a green pen was put in there. Uh, I think the red pen, green pen is a, a wonderful change of practice. Um, taking the growth mindset action. So put yourself in a new situation that's uncomfortable can also mean that you're learning. Many times undergraduates for their first time in a research lab, and then even when they go on to graduate school, if that's their choice, it's an uncomfortable new situation. And that can mean, they can feel like they don't fit because they don't believe they're good enough to be there. And saying discomfort can often mean that there's just a lot to learn. So we wanted to share this with you today because I think that there are some very straightforward things and simple things you can do to have students that you're working with, mentees, not believe that their fixed mindset is the only way to go, that they're actually, if they take this growth mindset um, and question that voice, you role model that for them, you give them some resources and tell them that you're interested in thinking about growth mindset that can really overcome a lot of the negative voices and messages they tell themselves. So I'm gonna pause there before we go on to the last topic in case Melissa would like to weigh in on this at all or there's any questions or comments which you can put in the question window. Chris, I, I will ask you a question. Is there been research connecting um, the growth mindset with increased self-efficacy? That seems to be some of what you were talking about in terms of the impact of demonstrating the modeling this mindset, teaching them about mindset could be increased self-efficacy? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I do believe that um, I've, he I've heard colleagues speak to that research. I have to admit, I have not myself read um, uh, the studies that connect those two. Um, but absolutely, uh, I think uh, you and I and others might know exactly where to look and who's doing that kind of work. So that'd be uh, wonderful to investigate. And you're absolutely right. The prediction would be um, that folks who believe um, that they can progress and are told they can progress and, and they develop that um, growth mindset and they see those achievements along the way and overcoming um, those situations in which they feel like they may not be good enough, would definitely, you would expect them to result in an increased uh, sense of self-efficacy across different domains. 
Yeah, growth mindset and imposter syndrome along the same lines. Again, I've seen some work to this effect, but absolutely, I think they, they can work together and they can work against each other. So, you know, you can imagine even in this first bullet is if the voice is saying um, they're going to find out that you're not good enough and you believe that you're only as good as what they see and you believe that you're not good enough, those are going to really compound um, versus saying I'm, I'm you know, I, I may be in a position where I might find it difficult. I may even stumble. People might even say she still has a lot to learn, but I can get better at that and I can um, overcome that. Um, can certainly help to um, relay some of that imposter syndrome as well. Imposter syndrome, one of the confounding factors there is often the um, belief that you have to be able to do everything perfectly. And of course, that is completely um, contrary to the growth mindset. It's also impractical. All right. So um, in uh, the next topic and the last one we're going to talk about today is mental health and mentoring and resources. Um, and so I just first want to say that this is not my area of expertise, um, but it is a topic that uh, my colleagues and I have been asked more and more about um, in the realm of mentoring. Um, and so I'm going to be drawing heavily um, on materials um, from my colleague, Dr. Angela Byers Winston, who Melissa and I have had the pleasure of working with for quite a few years. Um, who actually is a counseling psychologist by training, but studies um, persistence and mentoring. Um, and so um, in other trainings we've done across the country, we've started to include some of um, this information and these resources. Um, but I definitely want to um, acknowledge that this really comes from her domain of expertise. I know Melissa has been doing some work in this domain uh, in the work in the graduate school um, as well at Michigan State, and I'm sure we'll have some uh, thoughts to add uh, as well at the end of this part. So I thought I'd start out, this is our final polling question, um, just with this uh, question, which is about how prepared you feel to deal with undergraduate students who experience mental health issues. And when I say mental health, I don't just mean clinically diagnosed mental health issues. I am also speaking about general anxiety, um, uh, low levels of depression, um, as well as just a lack of well-being. All right, I'm going to share this final result with you. So um, a real um, um, uh, spread here of a third feeling somewhat prepared, a third feeling underprepared, and um, a little under a third feeling very underprepared. Um, I think that this is pretty typical. Um, I don't think it's something um, we're often given some links to resources. We may get a little bit of preparation for how to deal with these things in terms of helping students find out um, who to go to with their needs. Um, but certainly in the realm of mentoring is not something that uh, up until recent years has been talked about much. So let me hide that last poll. So um, I thought we'd start with a final scenario. So, um, and I'd like you to keep in light that a lot of things can be going on and this was raised in the um, uh, responses that some of you offered earlier to, uh, in this webinar is mental health is sometimes in the back of our mind of what might be going on. So in this scenario, student X has been showing up late to the lab and he's distracted and quiet and seemed disengaged in lab meetings. And he's also missed several deadlines uh, that the two of you previously set. So what I'd like to invite you to do is in the question um, box, write a question you could ask, excuse the typo, um, this mentee to figure out what's going on. You don't know whether it's a mental health issue or not, but just what's a safe question to ask to start to unpack? Maybe let's get five, how about five questions people think that would be good to ask so that we have a, a range of examples. So seeing, you know, just a general, how are you doing? Um, seeming quiet today, how's lab or research going? How's your week been? How are things going? Everything okay? Would you like to talk about anything? Thanks for sharing those. So I start with this scenario and this question because as mentors, 
there's a lot of wonderment often about what's going on. And what we find with mentors across the country is there's a lot of anxiety and fear about what to ask if you're prying um, when you're crossing a line. I think all the questions that um, were typed and I just shared are very um, open-ended um, and not threatening. But a lot of mentors can feel very um, paralyzed by opening up conversation for the fear that something might go personal. And what I want to say is that I think that's a very real fear, but that when we're engaged in a relationship with a mentee, uh, it is personal. Um, and so we all have to figure out where our comfort zone is. But when we start to see behaviors that may indicate something's not right, um, it's very, very important not to ignore those factors. And so even if it's a simple, how are you doing question um, and checking in on that can really be start to establish that you're noticing, that you're caring and that you're checking in. And if behaviors don't change, that you continue to do that. So one of the approaches um, when you're seeing a student um, starting to act differently or you have um, reason to believe things uh, that something might be wrong is to really try to get at the underlying cause of the issue by asking questions as if you uh, gave examples of. So you can focus on seeking to understand, not mature, prematurely making attributional assumptions about behavior, and thinking about questions that can draw out information. You can try putting yourself in the mentee's shoes, asking what would help, being empathetic. It's not the same as sympathetic. And importantly for this discussion is that considering the impact of personal factors such as mental health. So I'd like to share with you um, some thoughts um, about the current state of mental health in college going populations um, to give you a little bit of the landscape um, and um, as well as some good news and things you can do. So the college populations have similar mental health concerns as the general public. So mood disorders followed by anxiety, anxiety disorders are most commonly treated at the college counseling centers. And there's an increase in psychiatric medication as well. So, um, uh, surveys, uh, for example, the one I show here, showed that 57.2% of college students felt things were hopeless. 39% felt they were so depressed it was difficult to function in the past 12 months. And these are people coming into the counseling center. So that's a large percentage. And so it's very likely that when we're mentoring um, college age students, we are going to encounter students who are struggling with things like anxiety, depression, um, general feeling of lack of wellness, let alone um, things that move into the realm of, of other more serious mental illness. I wanted to also give you a sense of graduate students because there's a very, very recent report that's getting a lot of publicity um, that this isn't just isolated to, to undergrads, that a survey of uh, 2279 um, graduate students from over 200 institutions showed that 41% had anxiety and 39% reported depression. And interestingly, strong mentorship correlated significantly with less anxiety and depression, really pointing out that mentors can really play a role um, in helping to bring down a little bit of that anxiety and depression simply by being supportive, both for their undergrads and in this particular study, the graduate mentees. So now 75% of all mental health conditions begin before the age of 24, which is why college is a really, really important time and why you're likely to um, see these things take um, a hold when you're working with undergrads and early grad students. But the good news is that 65% of counseling center clients say counseling helps and they remain in school or in graduate school or undergrad. And 64% say counseling helps improve their academic performance. So we wanna spend, um, just about five minutes on are what can you do as mentors um, to help undergraduate students and for those who are working with grad students, those as well. So one is to just be an attentive, supportive mentor. So again, remembering that uh, like the first prompt is just noticing what's going on and don't ignore out of ordinary, strange or inappropriate behaviors. If something seems out of sorts, if your gut's telling you something's not right, Invite the student to talk to with you at an appropriate time. Remember thinking about privacy. If you think that the conversation is going um, to move in a direction that privacy needs to be considered, there are health privacy laws. You want to be sensitive and not callous. You don't want to make judgmental comments or criticism or even evaluation um, of what's happening. You want to talk in confidence and listen carefully, asking open-ended questions. And be direct. Ask a student if they have a problem she would like help, he, she or he would like help addressing. Empathize the importance of exercise, sleep, and diet. Um, uh, Dr. Bryce Winston's um, always reminding me to stress that sometimes these behaviors are so exacerbated by just simply a lack of getting up and taking a walk. 
not getting enough sleep, not eating, and refer, refer, defer. Have names and numbers of your campus resources available, including emergency after and after hours contact, so that if something is raised in the conversation, you can refer them to your campus folks. You do not need to, nor should you be a counselor um, and start to help somebody navigate uh, real mental health issues. Your role uh, is to refer them and be supportive um, and to have them find help they need to deal with anxiety or depression or more serious issues that may be impacting their well being and that would be impacting their performance. Always offer to help make contact with someone who can help. And being aware about, and, and two things to think about is being aware of concerns that might be stigmatized or judged. This is really important with underrepresented folks who already may feel stigmatized and judged. So when you raise these things, um, being aware that that may trigger um, and just to be sensitive to it. And reassure students that therapists at the Student Counseling Center work with people of a wide range of concerns. And that includes just being stressed out about school, feeling unbalanced in their life. Those are not small issues. They can be raised with the counseling centers. So we wanted to leave you with some additional resources. Um, college and Your Mental Health is a wonderful uh, college guide that you may think about checking out. Um, in terms of thinking about working with undergraduates. And I also, for those working with graduate students, um, there's a very, very new article on the evidence for mental health crisis in graduate education um, and things to think about in terms of addressing that. So we wanted to give you the perspective across um, both of those career stages. So I wanted to pause here. Um, I know, Melissa, you've done a lot of work in this area. If you wanted to add anything, and then of course, please, um, any questions or comments in the uh, question window would be appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, this is such an important topic. And another perspective I think I would bring is we talk to what you don't want to do. We've had an increasing number of departments that literally have mental health emergencies. Um, they've had a few suicides here. And so one of the things we're trying to talk about is what can you do proactively to set a culture where talking about mental health challenges are OK? So for example, as a part of orientation, um, mental health um, sort of information sessions and workshops are being done in the department orientation sessions now. Um, different departments are posting context at the counseling center. So I think thinking about how you can um, sort of make people feel less ashamed about um, struggles and you can do some very easy um, things to sort of symbolically show that you know this is important and you care about the community's mental health. Um, I think another issue too is just being really sensitive to the cultural dimensions, as um, Chris said. Um, international students, in particular, have come from a lot of different countries where, you know, admitting um, that folks are struggling with mental illness is downright dangerous to say. Um, I know in our counseling center, we have some incredible experts. So in addition to sort of doing some of these um, things to impact the broader culture and messaging in the department, educate yourself. Um, walk over to your counseling center if you have not been there um, ever or in a while and ask them, you know, if I have a student in my lab who um, seems to be struggling, what will happen when they get here? So you can sort of set the expectations um, and talk to the student in a way that you confidently can say, you know, th this is what's gonna happen when you go. Um, I've seen people start to walk folks over. So I think the degree to which you can, number one, educate yourself about the resources on your campus and your community, um, but also, again, modeling um, what it means to have a department, a lab, where mental health is something that's talked about um, and where folks um, you know, don't have to be ashamed when they have challenges. Thanks, Melissa. Yes, Stephanie posted a question about you know, a situation where a student is going through a mental health issue and wants to take extra time to address it and wants to know if the student can continue to work um, with uh, Stephanie as a mentor. And how do you strike that balance between supporting a student to take time away and trying to get research results produced? And I'm so glad you asked that because that's really where the rubber hits the road. It's so difficult. You wanna be supportive. Um, you want to give people the space and the time they need to deal um, with their needs um, and what has happened. Um, you, in many cases, um, you want to, you may even be wanting to give accommodations um, to do that, have that be supported, but you also have things that need to get done. And so um, a couple things, um, again, um, just paying close 
attention to time that I want to raise is one is you don't have to navigate this alone. So um, uh, most campuses have employee assistance centers or have centers where they can, you can go to um, to get uh, trained professionals to help you navigate these um, complex interactions which have to deal with accommodations and legality of that, with disclosure and with productivity. And so I will say from personal experiences, I spent many years thinking I had to figure out how to navigate this on my own, thinking I was you know, a sensitive person and so it'll be okay. What I have learned over the last five years is that even with my best intentions and myself learning, uh, that the professionals are incredibly helpful in navigating this because they can speak to things like, when is it an accommodation? When is it not practical? When is it going to be good for the student, but actually damaging for the rest of your lab and the productivity? What are the consequences it's gonna have on the rest of the group? Let's say you have a lab group and you have one person who's taking, uh, undergrad is taking a lot longer and the other undergrad is getting resentful now. These are things that's a very complex, it's a situation. And so what I really encourage you to do is to seek advice from people who see these situations all the time. Um, and if you don't know who that would be on your campus, um, I'm sure that um, you can find out. I was surprised there's a whole unit on our campus and they are incredible. Um, but I, the other thing I do wanna uh, stress is that it's really important um, to make sure when it is a legal accommodation and when it is just being supportive. Um, and again, those are hard calls to make on your own. Um, but if it is just being supportive that when you choose to do that, it has implications on the rest of your team, if you have a team. Um, and so that is without disclosing um, confidential information, it's important to talk about with the team um, the need for different people having different needs and different timelines um, and different um, over time and that they may be in a situation in which they need that too so that people don't start to make judgment calls or start to feel resentful about how certain people have accommodations and others don't it's something i've struggled with myself it's very touchy i've asked for a lot of help um, but i think it's really important that it's not just between you and the student the specifics are but it's actually important on the whole climate of the group you work with yeah, Chris, and I'll just really quickly add, for those of you who are working at universities, one of the things that graduate students and undergrads often have to developmentally learn how to do, especially if there's some longer term mental health issues, is to seek accommodations and seek those from a resource center for persons with disabilities. So actually, if someone is asking for an accommodation, at least at my institution, there is a very formal process that they go through. So some of what I've had to do is say, telling students actually, yes, obviously, willing to accommodate, but I'm gonna need some guidance from the resource center to help me decide, um, you know, and you and I decide what the best accommodation will be. So again, I think encouraging people, if there's some more longer term things, to um, seek out support. Thanks, Melissa, for saying that. Yeah, especially if your undergrads are taking research for credit, they fall under that umbrella of coursework accommodations um, and so at most institutions, so that's a really good point. So in the last two minutes we have together, what we wanted to do, and, and I apologize that I don't have a poll um, up for this, but you can type it in the questions window, is we'd like to know if you're returning um, in April, what topics you'd like to address in the final webinar of the series. I've put up uh, five topics um, that are often discussed in um, webinars and trainings like this, but we are interested in any topic. For example, the mentoring and mental health was a suggestion by a couple people last time, um, which is not something we would typically do in these webinars, but people were very interested in that topic. So we'll give you the last minute. Um, to share in the questions window. Uh, if you have a preference, um, we'd love to be able to align it with expectations that you have and needs. Uh, and then um, I will turn it over to David for the last minute. There was one vote by Eleanor Close for uh, <laughs> equity and inclusion. Great, yep, we're seeing lots of votes and we'll tally those up and use those um, to make decisions for April. So David, any last words? Yes, um, hello everyone, thank you. Please uh, continue voting there if uh, you haven't already. Um, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Melissa, for that very interesting presentation. Um, I'm sure a lot of you uh, found it interesting and may have more questions. 
Um, this is all the time we have today for this webinar. Um, but we do welcome you to follow up with either me or Chris on any remaining questions you might have. And of course, please um, uh, join us for the April 24th webinar if you're able. Um, as I said, a recording of today's presentation and a PDF of the slides will be put on our website as well as the other resources that Chris mentioned. And um, there are actually already a number of resources on the site from uh, last time's webinar, um, last month's webinar. Please spread the word to your colleagues if you know anyone who might be interested. Um, you don't have to have been at any of the previous webinars to be at the one on April 24th. Um, so we, I hope to email you within the next week to let you know that the resources are online, but feel free to check back anytime. Um, and I think that's all I have. Oh, I should uh, make a quick plug though. We are having a, a conference in November, the National Mentoring Community in conjunction with the um, APS Bridge Program for uh, getting students into graduate school um, are having a joint conference um, in Stanford at the, at the Stanford campus. Actually, part of the day will be at Google headquarters um, the weekend before Thanksgiving. Uh, we don't have a website for that up yet, but I hope you all um, can mark that on your calendars and uh, consider coming, and we'll be sure to let you know more about that later on. So that's all we have now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Chris, and um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.